call the Chino City Council and the successor agency to the Redevelopment Agency to order for our workshop. Today is uh, Tuesday, May 9th, 4 o'clock. I'd like to note that all council members are present. I'd like to call on uh, Mayor Pro Tem Comstock to lead us in the flag salute. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mayor. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in saluting our nation's flag. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Karen. Next item on the agenda is public comments. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to address the council on an item that is not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we will move on. Oh, I'm sorry, we did receive one uh, email public comment that's been provided to the City Council and will be saved to the meeting record. First item for discussion is homeless services in the City of Chino. This is to receive a report regarding our homeless services programs. Our staff report uh, this evening will be by Anna Lizette Ordonez, Community Services Supervisor, Tracy Rossetti Smith, Senior Management Analyst, and Corporal Stephen Jitet. 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 French. Quality of Life Team. Sorry about that, Stephen. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Ewa and members of the council. Um, this afternoon, we'll be providing a report on our City of Chino's uh, Homeless Services programs and um, some of the services that the city in general provides to our unsheltered population. So the services that the city offers are provided through different programs within the city and different um, collaborations between different departments uh, through the city of Chino. Um, our case management programs are available through our senior center. Um, individuals of 50 years and above are able to receive case management services through the senior center. Our uh, through the Neighborhood Activity Center, um, individuals between the ages of 18 and 49 years old are able to receive uh, case management services through the Neighborhood Activity Center. And then families with children um, enrolled in the Chino Valley Unified School District or uh, between the ages of zero to five are able to receive case management services through our Hope Family Resource Center. Um, case management services are what we call inter um, preventive, preventive preventable um, services. This is, uh, is to prevent families and individuals from becoming homeless. So uh, we are providing linkage to different resources and referrals uh, that you know, hopefully will prevent, again, families and individuals from becoming homeless. And then through our homeless outreach program, which is a collaboration between community services, our Chino Police Department's quality of life team and development services, um, we are also able to provide services to our chronically uh, homeless individuals. And Jate will uh, give you a little bit of information about that program. So our department's quality of life team consists in the field of myself and three of my partner officers, as well as a probation officer with the probation care unit, which is their community action response and engagement team. We're supervised by Sergeant Franks, and we essentially go out in the field and provide case management and try to provide that same linkage to resources, but out in the field, whether it's freeway embankments, storm drains, the wash areas, anywhere we can find people that are homeless and in need of resources or calls that we receive, we're gonna go out there, find them, basically assess them, find what their specific needs are and offer them those particular resources that we've kind of studied and really just learned much of the time through internet searches to kind of educate ourselves. It'll, it'll help us greatly once these new positions that have been added recently, the outreach coordinator and assistant coordinator, once they're able to come out in the field and help us as well, we'll work directly with them as well as community services to continue providing those resources in the field as well. And so the main difference between the case management programs and our homeless outreach program is um, for individuals that are able to come to the centers to request for services, this is where our case managers will provide the service. Um, chronically individuals or homeless individuals usually do not come into the centers to request services. So that's where our quality of life team and then uh, eventually our two new positions through community services will be able to do the outreach out on the street, um, provide that information to the individuals that are not able to come into our centers. 
And then through our Emergency Housing Assistance Program, this is a collaboration between community services and development services. Uh, and th this program provides um, our case managers the ability to assist individuals and families with rental, utility, security deposit, as well as emergency motel stay um, assistance. Um, so again, uh, families and individuals are able to apply for these programs and these uh, services through our case managers, um, as well as uh, we've utilized the emergency motel stay with our chron chronically homeless when we're able to place them um, either in a rehabilitation center or a shelter. Um, and it's usually uh, if uh, we have something in place already that we are able to utilize these services. So some of the services that we have provided this year uh, through our case management services, as you can see, through the Senior Center, we've assisted 86 unduplicated clients for a total of 1,656 total units of service. Um, through the Neighborhood House, uh, Neighborhood Activity Center, sorry, um, we've assisted 272 unduplicated clients for a total of 2,008 units of service. And through our Whole Family Resource Center, which um, I, I didn't mention, but it, it is a collaboration with the school district, uh, we've assisted 1,004 unduplicated clients with a total of 13,084 units of service. And then, Jate, if you wanted. So for our quality of life team, we've contacted 29 new clients since November of 2022. 515 total contacts, so obviously there's been quite a bit of overlap and, and contact the same folks numerous times. Uh, part of that, I can say, is statistically it takes about 70, 70 contacts or tries to get somebody to accept services. So you can see when we have this many new people, when we only have 29 new people but 515 contacts, that uh, makes a big difference is because we're having to recontact many of our, our locals so many times. For the, for the year since uh, January, we've gotten 17 total street exits, so 17 individuals housed in various programs or in permanent housing, and as well as three families, of one of which was three, a family of three, a family of five, and a family of six. So including those families, we've gotten a total of 31 people off the streets thus far. Um, on the right-hand side, this is what I, uh, just a example of what I send to the city for a street exit narrative so that they can get a synopsis of the client's name and where it was that they went. Many of these ones are faith-based living. Part of the reason the faith-based living is seen a little bit more often is because that's the most readily available one. And oftentimes clients are, hey, I'll accept services if you can get me somewhere today. So when it's when we kind of get the ultimatum of I'm only going to do it today, that's when we kind of reach out to these faith-based ones. Because while they might not have the same medication and um, different programs to do rehabilitation and detox, they do have immediate availability and it does provide some sort of stable housing and food and clothing to the individuals. Um, service connections are when we link them to mental health services, not necessarily, not like a residential one, but more of a one day get resources started. So those are kind of our starting points with them. And this is just an example again of what I send to the city each month. And the great thing about this collaboration is that our case managers, if they do come into um, contact with a homeless individual, um, they will collab or we will work together with Quality of Life so, um, to work together and find the most appropriate resource. Um, when it comes to families, uh, um, Corporal Jete is really good at uh, connecting them with the whole family resource center, uh, making sure that they are receiving the academic support that they are needing uh, through the school district as well. Good afternoon. I'm going to discuss the um, homeless prevention funding opportunities that the city has taken advantage of. Um, in affordable housing funds, since 2021, we have dedicated $750,000 to the homeless prevention programs. Essentially, this is $250 per fiscal year, and this limitation is based on provisions of the community re redevelopment law that we can allocate that amount per year. As far as services provided with this funding, there's been 128 individuals for a total of 1,763 service contacts through the case management program, and 87 residents received utility, rental, and or emergency hotel vouchers with this funding. We also utilized emergency rental program funding through CDBG CV3 funds. This is one-time supplemental HUD funding as a result of the pandemic. 
there was $322,690 provided and 78 households were assisted with emergency rental during that, during that time that the funding was available. As far as looking into the future, the city is looking at a transitional housing facility in collaboration with um, city departments and partnering agencies for a comprehensive approach. This would be to build and operate a transitional housing facility. And grant opportunities that are being explored are PLHA uh, funds. These are state allocated funds on an annual basis to provide assistance to homeless population or those in need of affordable housing. We're also looking into federal earmark funds in submitting an application for funding for this particular project and uh, collaborating with the county to explore funding opportunities that might be available. So some of, some of the most uh, frequently used services or resources that our case managers utilize to assist families and individuals um, are listed here. I, I will name a couple of one, a couple of them. Um, United Way 211 is the linkage resource. Um, so if we we're able to connect uh, families and individuals to through 211 uh, for different resources as far as food, clothing, housing, and shelter services. Uh, Mercy House is an access center. Um, they also link uh, families and individuals to um, shelters, transitional housing, and permanent housing programs. Um, community Action Partners of San Bernardino County. They assist with um, food assistance, utility and rental assistance, uh, rapid rehousing programs, motel vouchers, um, DMV ID reduced assistance. Uh, for food, we usually utilize uh, Food for Life uh, and God's Pantry, um, as well as Isaiah's Rock. And then through our Chino Neighborhood House, we also refer families and individuals for assistance with food and hygiene items. Um, and then some of the country, county programs that we um, refer families to include uh, the Children's Fund with the, uh, they have an emergency assistance program where families are also able to get assistance uh, with rental and utility assistance, household items, clothing, um, and uh, many other um, resources. Uh, our county social services, so our case managers are able to assist families and individuals apply for um, CalFresh, Medica uh, CalWorks, and Medi-Cal and Housing Authority of San Marino County. Um, this is a little bit more tricky because we're only able to assist families in getting into the wait list for many of these programs. Um, there's really, it's, it's very rare to find um, anything available right away. So most of the time we're just assisting families get into their wait list. For our quality of life team, many of the resources we use cross with what Anna was just explaining. Some of the ones that are a little bit more specific to us, though, I'll go over here is the um, county programs that we use, our Merrill Center and Windsor Center. Those are stabilization centers, which provide for 23 hours of a stay for somebody. And they're kind of like the starting point or the gateway to get people services uh, for mental health or substance abuse. Most of the clients that we're dealing with that have been chronically homeless, they have one, the other, or probably both. So that's kind of a starting point for us. They can help us with referrals to these longer term programs below, such as Casa Paseo, Desert Hill. What those are is those are residential treatment centers for mental health. So they can stay there for 30 to 90 days. They get medication compliant, and then they really try to help them so that they can be a little bit more independent for future. And then we're able to get them into different types of programs or housing from there once they're stable. Cedar House in Inland Valley in that line with St. John of God. Those are detox and rehab centers. So those are also run by the county. A Little bit of a lengthy process to get in sometimes, but they do provide a good service. And again, 30 to 90 days of treatment in those, and then they can transition into sober living from there. We utilize the probation department, especially now with our probation partner. They have specific housing for probationers that have immediate availability as well. The biggest hang up on that is just the rules. A lot of probationers don't want to drug test daily or weekly to get into those, um, but they are available to them and they are available to them essentially as clients for life after they've been on probation. Housing Authority, just like Anna had explained, we utilize them to get started with different programs. Those ones kind of come and go, but they are, they are really good opportunities for people once they do have themselves stable. We use community shelters, Path of Life, Hope for Homes, and Central City Lutheran Mission. That's One's Riverside, Pomona, and the city of San Bernardino. Those are the community shelters that we utilize most often. 
faith-based, as I mentioned before, is, is our really our go-to for somebody who's, I need services right now, and this is going to be the one day I'm going to take it. Those are where we lean on for that. Set Free, Victory Outreach, and Teen Challenge are the three most often used. Uh, again, a little bit of a drive for those, but we provide transportation anywhere these people need to go. And if we can't, we, if we can't drive them there ourselves, we'll figure a way out to get them there. So it's not an issue for us. And then room and board programs are specifically for our clients that do have an income, whether it's social security or disability. They're usually on average about $800 a month and we're able to get them into those programs which provide food, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner and a, and a bed to sleep in each night. So some of the barriers and challenges that um, both the case managers and our homeless outreach uh, quality of life team has uh, come into, um, I guess, have seen are limited funding either through the programs that we are referring sometimes, a lot of the times uh, when we are referring a family to, uh, for example, let's say Mercy House, we are informed that for that month the funding has been depleted and so we have to call back at the beginning of the month. Um, limited resources, especially within our area, um, there's a lot of a lot of um, limited resources when it comes to shelters for families, especially um, qualification guidelines. Uh, some sometimes we are able to refer to a particular uh, program, but the family or individual, um, because of certain guidelines that they have, do not qualify for those programs. Um, sometimes it's a lengthy process, like I mentioned with the county programs. Um, there's a long wait list. Um, and so having to assist the family until they're able to receive the assistance um, is what we focus on at that point. Uh, difficulty reaching program staff. A lot of the times um, we contact different agencies um, and we're not able to get a hold of someone or even receive a call back. So we're always having to call um, and be um, insisting on, you know, hopefully getting someone across. Um, again, no shelters near the area or limited availability. Um, particularly for our families, um, this is an issue when they have older uh, children uh, because a lot of the shelters, family shelters, um, teenage boys are not able to stay with the family, so they are, um, they're, they're going to have to separate. So the individual, the teen boy might go to a male shelter and then the younger kids and the mom will go to the family shelter and a lot of times families will not want to separate. Limited client income, um, like Jute said, some of the programs do require that the family have some sort of income in order to uh, uh, qualify for the program, and uh, there are some in cases where uh, individuals and families don't have any uh, income or sufficient income coming through. And then, you know, clients want to stay in the area. They feel safe. Um, they know, you know, the city, especially when they come, when they have the children, it's very difficult for them to, for example, if we find a shelter or a program in San Bernardino, it's very difficult for them to say yes, because now they're having to move their kids out of the area. Um, and then clients' willingness to accept services can also be a barrier for, for us to get them connected to a program. Anything else you want to add, Jatay? Yeah, for, our, for our team specifically, the, the last two, the clients wanting to stay in the area and their willingness to accept services are definitely the biggest hurdles that we come across. It, it doesn't anymore because I've gotten used to it, but it, it initially surprised me a lot how many people would tell me legitimately they would rather be homeless in the city of Chino than have an apartment in a city such as San Bernardino. They would rather live on the streets here than, than have to go over there. Um, so that's been a hurdle for us with certain individuals especially when they do have a limited income or no income, because obviously when you come over to the West End, it's a little bit more expensive. As I stated earlier, the, the willingness to accept services, again, an average of 70, of 70 contacts for somebody to accept services is, is a big barrier. And then the other thing that you also tack on top of that is the majority of the time, especially for these folks with substance abuse, the first, oftentimes second, third time in a, in a program isn't necessarily the one that sticks. So you might have to restart that process over again. And also being that we are police officers, we have to get over that human hurdle where, hey, maybe they haven't had the greatest interactions with police in different cities or they've been arrested recently and we have to, we have to convince them again, hey, we're here to help you. Um, so generally it does come with time and that's why we're out there contacting a lot of the same people each and every day. But um, I would definitely say those are kind of our biggest hurdles that we come across. 
And then these are some collaboratives and committees that our staff are involved with. Um, the West Valley Regional Steering Committee, which is led by the San Bernardino County Homeless Partnership, uh, Focus on Youth Collaborative, which is led by the Community Services Department and Chino Valley Unified School District, our Face Faith Collaborative, which is led by PD and Community Services Department, um, our City of Chino Homeless Task Force, which is led by Community Services Department, Communi Community Engagement Initiative, which is led by the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, Fontana PD Homeless Outreach Committee, which is led by the Fontana Police Department, and then of course our public service clubs. That concludes our report. Are there any questions? Or we are more than happy to answer. I'm curious as to why they don't allow teenage boys to stay with their family. A lot of the times it's safety related. Um, so if you have a teen boy who is 17 and then you have um, another family that has a five-year-old daughter, they might not feel um, safe to be in the same um, shelter. So it usually has to, it has to do with safety. Hmm. Seems like you'd be causing the, the young men a lot of problems separating them from their families. Right, which is, like I said, most of the time the families will refuse to go to a shelter in that case. Yeah, I can understand that. Questions from council or comments? I'll just start down the line. Chris, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, not right now. I'll pass for now, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Mark? No, I, I appreciate you guys um, going out there and making those contacts. I know that from everything that I've read is that the continuous contacts lets them know that you're not just there today, that you're gonna be there long term, so therefore you build a relationship and trust. So I know it's gonna take a long time for you guys to build that relationship, especially law enforcement. A lot of them come over and you're right, they haven't had the best relationship and our previous way of policing homeless has been completely different in the past, so a lot of them still remember that. But I appreciate you guys getting on this because unlike the, the homeless that we have here currently, when you compare them to the homeless in other cities like Los Angeles, where they tend to have more of a violent history and are more recently released from prison, and then therefore they go over to Los Angeles because there's more services down there. And they're a little bit more unstable, so I think if we continue to, to deal with our homeless here, continue to contact them. And a lot of times is if you keep contacting them, they just go somewhere else where they're not contacted. Um, but it, it helps us to at least get an idea of who's out there um, and that it doesn't spiral out of control to where we start having violent homeless here. So I appreciate you guys' effort. I know it takes a long time. I know it's not easy, and it's a different way of policing, obviously, but it's something that we need to deal with, especially moving forward, because it doesn't seem like this is going away. So I thank you for all your efforts, and I appreciate all, your, all, your, all everything you're doing. Thank you. Karen. Thank you, Mayor. First thing I'd like to comment was uh, in attending the Cal Cities Conference, this is certainly not a problem that's unique to us. The entire state of California is experiencing the same types of problems that we are, as well as other states across the nation. One of the most difficult challenges we're having is getting our mind around this population that seems to be growing and how to properly address it. My questions are, outside of the, the areas that you've discussed where we depend on other county services, and I think what was eye-opening today is that we're, it appears we're using almost every resource that's available to us in the county and collaborating. Where do you see us most deficient currently where we could, as a council, help fund that or at least consider funding it to help us be more effective? Or is that, is it just too many areas to answer or is there one no, specific I, area I, that stands out? Um, I, well, I think uh, a lot of the Families, I can talk more about our families that uh, we assist. Um, the majority of the most difficult difficulties that they're experiencing is the increase in um, rent, right? And, and um, so having the rental assistance has helped. Um, but with that said, um, we can only assist for up to three months. Sure. And so if their income doesn't increase and if the rent doesn't come down, then they're going to be in the same position. That's where we're seeing the majority of um, the most challenges that, that we see. Um, we tend, you know, that's the, the case managers do try to connect them either with CalFresh if they are able to qualify so that they can at least have additional 
um, assistance coming in. We connect them with um, low-income uh, programs that reduces their utility bills. Um, and, you know, so we're trying to figure out ways that they can save money, um, connecting them to food pantries so that they can have more towards their rent each month. But unfortunately, that's just a bandage. Um, and we, you know, we discuss with our families, you know, what is the next step for, for you and your family? You know, do we need to help you look for a different location? Um, but as you may know, rent is just increasing all around, so. Rent is a challenge in every community. Okay. I agree that the, the families are the ones that are a little bit mo uh, more challenging for us in the field. The, the county programs that we have work for us for our chronically homeless, those who need substance abuse, that sort of thing, where we kind of scramble and, and reach out to community services and are really having to brainstorm and find things is when we have whether they're living in a car, they went to community services in the first place is when we have families, especially women with young children. And then we're trying to find, okay, we can't just leave you here while we search for everything because everything's a, a lengthy process. It takes a little bit of time. So we're having to scramble. Luckily, our faith-based community does help us a lot with whether it's motel stays or things here and there, but, but we're still having to kind of bounce them from spot to spot in the meantime while we're trying to find something longer term. So. I would say that's that's the biggest challenge in, in terms of what the city can potentially help with a solution for is those types. Okay. So the the mentally ill or the chronically addicted individual is proves easier through the services that we have or through the county to provide for versus a family that's falling short month to month on their rent. More difficult. Okay. But I, I do have to say that transitional um, housing would help both um, okay. populations because when they, for example, if a chronic individual, um, if the Jate is able, or Cooper Jate is able to connect them to a county program, but it's gonna take five days, maybe two weeks for them to actually get accepted, then we can place them in this program where you know they are able to connect with them on a daily basis, they know where he is, um, and so when that uh, uh, um, spot opens up, they're able to have locate him and take him, as well as for families, uh, like Jate say, a lot of the times we're able to connect them to transitional housing, but it can take up to a month for them to actually get in. And so we're able to have this facility where um, we are able to place a family or an individual, um, and the mean, meanwhile, we're able to connect them to that program. Um, that would be okay. one of Okay, good to know. Where are we at with hiring our two new caseworkers that we took into the budget to help us with the um, dissolution of SLAD? So they are going through background right now, okay. through Chino PD. Okay. Um, go ahead. They're going, they're going through the, the PD background, yes. which is a little bit longer. Yes. So I just want to make Underst sure. Understood. Okay. And I agree with some of the comments that have been made here by our staff and uh, Corporal Jate. This is a completely different way and different model of policing. I mean, because of some of the, the manners in which we policed homeless in the past, um, it does take a lot of relationship building. And I wanna thank um, you officer, I'm sorry, Corporal Jate and some of our staff. The, the, the one way that we know that some of these individuals will accept help is just through personal relationship building with our staff and of course with the police department finally when they get to that point where they feel like they can have enough trust and confidence in the person that's you know, going to steer them in the right direction and that's when they'll accept that help. And I know that takes a phenomenal amount of actually contacts with people from actually having served in that capacity in the past. And then my last comment, Mayor, is I too would rather be homeless in Chino than live in <laughs> other communities yeah. as I know all too well. So where I would call that a, being a victim of our own success which is not necessarily a bad thing, it's something to be proud of, so thank you. It's kind of a double-edged sword. Yes. <laughs> Curtis. I do appreciate uh, the work that we're doing now. I think that our community is, is different and I, I appreciate the fact that we're customizing our team uh, to the needs of the community. And that's extremely important because what's important here may not be important next door in Ontario or any of the other cities. Uh, the question I have is, have we had any families that uh, were homeless that had school-aged children 
uh, with them? And if so, uh, how are we able to, or how were we able to get them involved uh, with resources through the school district? So the great thing about the collaboration we have with the Chino Valley Unified School District through the HOPE program is that um, that program has both district and city staff. And so our case managers, our city case managers, are able to work with the family to find resources, whether it's for food, housing, you know, whatever the resources or the need is. Um, and then the district side focus on um, making sure that the students are um, being uh, provided the services they, they are needing and so they are, they are uh, academic, academically successful in their school. So they are connecting them to um, receive assistance with transportation, um, making sure that they are, especially if it's a homeless individual through the McKinney-Vento law, um, they are able to ensure that the student is registered immediately without having to wait for transcripts or um, immunization. Um, they are making sure that they are receiving tutoring. Um, so that's the great part about that collaboration is that we not only are our, our city case managers focusing on the family life, but we have our district staff who are making sure that they are um, receiving all the services that they are needing to be successful in their in their academics. Great. Thank you very much. I don't have anything further, Mayor. Okay. A couple of things. Um, Omnitrans has a program for students, free transportation to school. I don't know what's required for um, a young person to sign up for that, but that might be something that helps some of the homeless people. I'm not really sure. Do you ever contact Omnitrans? Yes, we actually do connect them. Um, we also have, or the district has another program that they are utilizing. It's kind of like Uber. Um, and this is mainly because if uh, we do place a family, let's say at a shelter in San Bernardino, um, it could take the student you know, hours to get to Chino. And so um, utilizing the other uh, form of transportation has assisted us. Um, unfortunately, it's maybe within the next year, they will be losing the funding for that. But in the past, that's what we used to utilize um, Omnitrans okay. or gift cards, um, gas cards. I'm also curious, um, and this is really outside the box. I don't even know if it would be legal, but for people that, that need rent assistance, is there any way the city can have a um, rental assistance work program? For instance, if, uh, if an able-bodied person is able to work, hasn't been able to find job, they can't, find, they can't afford rent, could we perhaps have them part-time with public works, clean up the parks, and in exchange for a paycheck, we actually subsidize the rent? I don't know if that would be possible, but I think it would be worth looking into. It would help us with labor, yeah, and it would help them get a, get a house. Sounds, it sounds interesting. I think the one piece we're missing, aside from the transitional housing, is probably some type of workforce development uh, on top of that. I think those are probably two pieces that we could improve, um, um, improve upon. So yeah. I'm thinking that might be helpful. Um, and then I wanted to compliment also PD and the Quality of Life team. I know we often get people coming into our town claiming to be homeless and soliciting funds because they need money for food or whatever, and they're not legitimate at all. And they're actually taking advantage of our very, very um, well-intended minded community, which I really resent. So I know I've called several times when I see somebody you know, with a child and a sign, and sure enough, it ends up they've got a perfectly fine car, they have a nice home in another, another city, but they're just here soliciting funds. So I really appreciate the effort of the Quality Life team that made those people move on. Our community is too forgiving and too generous to be taken advantage of. Thank you. Any other questions, Chris? Um, okay. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Um, great presentation. Um, two questions. Um, one was for, um, I guess, community perspective. What was our homeless count um, this past year? Yeah. I believe we were at 26. Um, I thought it was 23, from my understanding. Yeah. In that mid 20s. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's right in that mid 20 range. Okay. Yeah. And um, follow up question to that is, it was mentioned a few times our our faith based um, 
you know, when, when there's immediate need for housing, um, sometimes faith-based will step in and, you know, take care of that immediate need. Um, two two that, I, that I've seen in the presentation were Victory Outreach and uh, Set Free Women's Ranch in Lake Elsinore and a Men's Ranch in Lake Elsinore. Um, are, are, are there any of those faith-based, um, uh, you know, um, yeah, any of those faith-based located here in Chino um, that provides that immediate need um, regarding the housing? There are. So Living Word is a faith-based program. A men, they have a men's actually and a women's home now. It's, that's right there on F, uh, the corner of number five and F Street. So there's Living Word. They have a location up on Philadelphia as well. There's closer ones like, such as Montclair as well. Those ones just generally have wait lists. So a lot of the ones that are closer to our area have wait lists, whereas Set Free, they have a couple of different locations. Victory Outreach has, including their women's homes, they have at least three or four, if not more. So there's generally just more open availability for same day for those other ones. Okay. But we do have, have some, and some of the people that we get to those other faith-based programs, for, for some reason it just didn't work out here at ones like Living Word and things like that, but they're willing to try another one, so. Hmm. Well, again, thank you guys for the presentation. Thank you for the information. And uh, council, I can attest for Corporal Jete. I mean, that's a there's a reason why you want Officer of the Year. Mm -hmm. um, I see him at work, you know, uh, almost every single day, and uh, you do some good stuff over there. So, thank you guys. Thank you. You have a great reputation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions? I'd like to just add one thing. So. In Chino, we have this unique relationship, not only with our school district, but with our nonprofits in our community. And the reason we're successful in this is because the council has provided funding for us to do what we do on the west end of the county. We've created a safety net for all of our people here. So if they're, they're falling, we have a way to catch them. And that wouldn't happen without the funding we've been given. And the team that we have, PD and community services, work really hard to make sure that all of our residents have what they need, whether they're sheltered or not. And we could not do it without the funding we've been provided. And I think we're unique in what we do and how we serve our community because of our partnerships. And once we move down the path of transitional housing and then maybe we look at some, some workforce development, I think that we'll have a, the whole package. And hopefully our homeless um, and unsheltered population will diminish. And so even if we have mid-20s on our count, you always want to times that by three. And that's probably closer to our real number. But um, contact with them and, and moving them on to better places is, is what this team does. So thank you for your support. And I think that when we started seeing the, the massive homeless encampments popping up in the city of Los Angeles, that's when we really sat down and said, we, we won't have that here in Chino, and we need to find a way. And we've done that mm -hmm. with this program we have. Last, last comment also, one thing I want to compliment you on is people, when they have animals, mm -hmm. you guys also provide pet care, and, and that is really important to a lot of people that are homeless. That that animal means the world to them. That has been a barrier for people in the past, Mary, and it's been huge for us to be able to collaborate with that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we do take advantage of as well is even just the medical services here locally through the um, Dr. Lyle's Healthcare Service Alliance and different things. We're very unique that way, and we're fortunate to have those things. So it helps us be more successful in servicing that, populate our, that, that portion of our population, so thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next item is parkland in the city of Chino. This is a report recurring regarding our current parkland and possible areas that need additional land. Our staff report this evening will be provided by our Parks and Capital Projects Manager, Carolyn Baltzer. I'm sorry, Mayor, I'm, I just wanted to check. Did we take public comment on the first oh, item? No, I sure didn't. Are there any public comments uh, on item number one? Seeing none, thank you for the reminder. Okay, item number two. Good afternoon, Mayor, Madam Mayor, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, today I'd like to discuss uh, parkland in the Ch in city of Chino, our current and future parkland. Sorry. Oops. So currently, um, in 2021, we completed the Parks and Facilities Master Plan. Um, and it can be found on our city's website as well as 
uh, www.chinocreatescommunity.com. Um, through the Parks and Facility Master Plan, this is kind of our living document that we're following for developing our parks and amenities and looking at our park locations. So currently we have 27 parks, which equal 254.75 acres of parkland throughout the city of Chino. At the time when we did the Parks and Facilities Master Plan, just want to note our population was 92,836 residents. Since then, today we've grown to 96,111 residents. So um, it is anticipated for us to reach around 100,000 residents by 2028. And the reason why I mention this is part of the, part of the uh, master plan was looking at our level of service. So the park level of service evaluated what, where our parks are deficient and where they're sufficient. Again, looking at the park location, amenities, and acreage. So per our current general plan, the acres that we build our parks is three acres per thousand residents compared to the national standard of 7.7 .7 acres per thousand residents. Our parks are typically um, constructed within a 10 minute walk or half mile walking distance. And this is a standard that was developed um, throughout the entire um, nation through ESRI. Um, this is a standard that they find that most people will walk um, be um, willing to walk to a park location. So looking at, um, again, through the level of service, our neighborhood parks, um, which are typically two to 10 acres, um, looking at um, the locations through the level of service of where our parks are located, um, there are parks that um, we're lacking in the older section of Chino and the northern section of Chino. The um, college park and preserve parks were included in a master plan, so the parks being developed out there do meet our current standard. So also part of the level of service was looking at our park amenities. Um, this is just a list of some of our um, park amenities and the special um, uses that we have throughout all of our parks. So based on um, the needs assessment and the level of service for our parkland, we found that we're deficient um, by 25 acres. So um, basically below the park level land measure, it's, we're deficient above park rich at level, we're sufficient. Um, so this, this evaluation again looked at all of our parks in the um, older section of Chino as well as the preserve and college park. I just want to make that notation. This map shows the, um, the current, it's a current um, map of all of our parks throughout the city. Um, again, having 27 parks that are owned by the city. And there are, this does include the, um, the HOA parks, some of the smaller parks that were developed out in College Park and the preserve. This map here is, um, we put together, um, this was based on the 2020 census. And what this map shows is the um, white circles is our level of service that is, um, so each park is in green and the area from the center of the park to the, uh, to the circle, the white circle, is a half mile radius. So this shows where we are sufficient in those locations for parkland, but the red dots show where we're deficient in parkland. So a lot of it, again, is in the northern section of Chino. There are a couple other areas um, to the west, um, just south of Chino Avenue. And then if you look um, in the preserve, a lot of the, the red dots, those are parks that have not been developed. So once those parks as are being currently planned and developed, those, will, um, those areas will become sufficient. That again is part of that master plan. So we're really focused on the existing portion of, um, of older section of Chino where we're lacking parks. I just want to note that some of the dots, if you see the boundary, the city boundary line, some of the red dots, Again, it's on a census block, so it was difficult to kind of remove some of those, so um, sorry about that. <laughs> but it, these are the areas to kind of, it shows us, gives us a picture of where we're lacking parks um, to provide that to our residents. 
So just looking at opportunities, um, so we again, our parks and facility master plan is our living document that we are, it's our guideline that we're following. So we will continue to implement looking at our parks on development, amenities, locations, um, and where our needs are for our park land. We're also using the general plan um, to right size our level of service, so kind of a combination of both of those. And then um, we're looking, we like to um, research and identify key properties for future park development and to purchase parkland as appropriate. And it, it can be the city purchasing or as a partnership. Um, what we're, we're looking at is kind of getting some guidance from the council to look at um, locations for future parkland so we don't miss the opportunity to purchase land where we can develop a park. I know that the sphere of influence is something that is being looked at. Um, again, that was not included in our master plan at the time because it was not, um, it was not uh, being looked at at the, at the time. So we would just like to answer any questions you may have or get some recommendations from you, please, on looking at uh, parkland. Carolyn, can you go back to that picture? I have a question. I've asked Linda um, a couple of times, and I still am not really comfortable with the answer. Um, you see where we're cutting the corner and then going up to Phillips, right? Yes. Okay. To the east of that is a parking lot that was uh, purchased by the, the association south of that and improved, and there's a curb and gutter. Okay? Yes. This shows that we're not widening it to where that curb and gutter is, and I think that's a mistake. Um, I know this property next to us will stick out, but I think it would be worthwhile for us to invest the money to in, in improve that street from Central all the way to where it's already improved where that parking lot is. And, and we, are, we are expanding the, um, the street. I know this doesn't reflect that, but we are actually, um, we are planning the street um, as, because it's supposed to be four lanes is the ultimate goal is to be four lanes and we are building it to meet the four lanes. So this doesn't reflect what it truly will be, but we okay. are expanding the street to meet that. So yes, we are doing that. Okay, because that doesn't reflect it. No, I'm sorry. No, it doesn't, but we are doing that. Okay, it's just I don't want that to stick out like a sore thumb. You know, we're doing the improvements. Let's not have to go back and redo it again. No, no, that's where we planned that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I'll take, I'll start at the other end and then ask for comments. Thank you, Mayor. Carolyn, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, on the map, if you can go one more back where the red dots are, uh, those are deficient areas that we've identified. Uh, is that because it's built out up there with homes or is there land available for us to go up and maybe purchase or reuse something that's already up there that we haven't thought about? So the red dots reflect 10 individuals. Um, just as a reference, the again, the service area, the red dots are outside of the service area that our parks are serving. So that's where we need to build park land. Um, and Again, this is, this is something that um, we're, we'd like to get your guidance on looking at parkland or property that's currently for sale that we can look at and, and de purchase to develop future parks. So we're looking at neighborhood parks, again, two to 10 acres. Um, so we don't miss that opportunity to build parks in these areas that, we're, that are deficient. Um, I know there are some properties are, that are for sale. Um, and I know some have already been sold that we've looked at through, since we worked on the master plan, we were looking at park, you know, at future park lands. So that's where we'd like to get your guidance on if we can pursue looking at purchasing park land to be developed into parks. But this I, doesn't show where that property is available. No, we don't have a, we don't have a list of the properties. Um, we just, if we can, with your um, guidance, if we can uh, move forward, we would research to look at property that is for sale and to see if that would be an appropriate location for parks to, um, for the area, for the areas that are in the deficient. But it, but it would have to be at least three acres? Is that what you're talking it can, about? It can't be just a regular 4.5 lot. No. 
It can be anywhere from two to 10 acres. I mean, Chino Rancho Park's 1.18 acres, and we're putting a lot, we're putting pickleball courts and um, playground restroom there with a parking lot. So there are things you can do if you, if you plan it correctly. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to um, be a neighborhood park, but that's something we're looking at because that's based on our master plan where we're deficient and, is and, neighborhood parks. And I and thank you for that. I, I was going to recommend if it wasn't that three-acre lot that we'd like to have, uh, we and it was smaller, we could do some type of specialty uh, function in there, like a pickleball court or a splash pad or something the like. Uh, as far as the sphere of influence is concerned, uh, I know a lot of that is still wide open, but that really, it doesn't really help us down in the down, further further south of that. So I would like us to, to keep our radar on looking for those possible properties, uh, maybe later to absorb, uh, to be able to satisfy the, the need of these parks. And Mayor and Council, we have been keeping our eye out there and looking at properties that we think might be available, maybe not necessarily for sale. Um, so we, we just want the authority to be able to go and, and actively do that. Karen. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, I would, uh, with the rest of the council's permission, make the recommendation that the staff bring us back um, parcels for consideration for the council to, to consider at a later time, number one. Um, I don't have any qu other questions, but I do have a, I guess, well, maybe they do have a question. There's been discussion from the county back and forth throughout the history of Chino in our, in our, in our local regional park in Prado. And I think we have a very nice park in Ayala that is um, has room for additional programming, right? We've always been talked about doing something with the golf center, which is something I would like to also see staff with the, you know, with the agreement of council, bring us back a recommendation for something we're going to do there. I mean, we've been asking for something to happen in that part for a very long time to improve it on that aspect. But with the Prado Regional Park, I know sometimes the county goes back and forth. I know they recently did a master plan, tried to bring them forward something that maybe residents would like to see down there. Uh, I, I have known in the past that they've kind of uh, vacillated back and forth as to whether they want to make the long-term commitment and investment to it, or if there's you know, potentially an opportunity for us to seize that, that park. I know we would have to um, really get our minds around how to program that park and change it, but I think that park has a lot of potential to serve our community in a way that it's not serving us the best right now. Um, Mayor, I know that you go down there and camp occasionally, but I think there's improvement for those campgrounds and glamping and different things that people would really enjoy. Um, and I just think we're going to need, particularly in the preserve, more more space. And when I look at you know maybe a, a park in a neighboring agency like um, Ontario has, it has like an abundance of soccer fields and different program there. I think we're just you know if that does present itself in the future, depending on what, where the county's going with that, I'd like for staff to pay attention to that and potentially bring that back to us at another time. So just, just my suggestion. We had an opportunity at one time to uh, get Prado Park, but the council at the time was not interested, which. I know, Mayor. I was a part of, part of the staff when that happened. I wish we would have seized that opportunity, but that was not the direction of the council at the time. And I tried. I'm hoping that that opportunity will present itself again. I so. tried. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that, that we and our staff could have made it very, very successful, Wonderful. but we lost that opportunity. They wanted to give it to us. I know. I don't rub it in. I know. I know. Hate that reminder. Yeah. Um, Mark. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I, I also agree, obviously, that we'd like to see a list of potential properties that come up for sale that we could look at. But one of the things that recently came up, and I did talk to one of the members of the a board of trustees for Chaffee College and they weren't aware of it, but there has been some rumblings that Chaffee College is not going to build out the college to the ultimate like they once said they were. And there is a lot of land on the south portion of that campus that originally they had said that we're gonna they were gonna create a sports complex down there. Okay. So I would like you know, our, our staff to kind of explore that and see if they're not going to build a sports complex and maybe we could add some additional soccer fields or baseball fields there and take it over. 
since I know at one time it was donated by by the state of California, the prison land, that hopefully we could probably pick it up probably for about the same amount of money that they paid for it, which was probably nothing. Dollar. Right. Dollar a year. So uh, if you guys could explore that, so that way we could develop a, a larger regional park where we could have some more soccer fields. And then there's, we, we've always talked about uh, creating some sort of park where we have some sort of indoor basketball something so it would be nice to look at look for some parkland where we can put some something like that because the only thing that we really have indoor right now is the knack and we already know that that's busting at the seams it's not enough we need something more than that i know that there's been a couple places and potentially calvary chapel was looking at the uh the school site that was once zoned or, or it's still zoned for a school up in in college park but it's a ten, i think it's 10 acres they still are yeah, uh, I mean, if somebody doesn't look at that, maybe that's something we may want to look at and potentially put a outdoor uh, indoor gymnasium there or something where we can utilize that for additional space that people have been wanting for a long time, some sort of huge gymnasium where we can run some programs similar to they run down there in the preserve and they, they do run down here, but there's so much wanting of, of an indoor facility that I think you know, we should always, besides that 10 acre parcel, so it's probably, you know, it, it could very well go to Calvary Chapel. It'd be great if they built a school there. But something that we're, when we're looking at it, that it's something that we've always been wanting to do, some sort of indoor facility and keep that in mind for, and, and anywhere in the city, I think it would work. But I, I'm also in agreement that we need, we would love to see a list of available parcels so that we can move forward in this. But if there's opportunities for places like, Shafee College that isn't going to do anything with it, that we start maybe moving towards that direction and start doing something with it ourselves. That's all I got. Thank you. Chris? Thank you for the presentation. A um, couple of questions, and this may be a question, actually. Maybe Nick may help answer, but that the vacant land there on Benson near our water treatment facility, what, do, we, do we know who, who that's owned? By? That's Ontario? No. No, on, on the, Just the corner. Yeah, um, and and I, I guess maybe there's a specific answer, but you can provide it. If not, I mean, when I just look at this space, I'm going all the way to Vernon. And I know at one point there was some development that was, um, you know, talked about there on Ooh, Vernon. Um, yeah. Again, there's a lot of open space, not undeveloped, and I'm sure you guys probably seen that before, but that seems like the perfect opportunity. Um, and looking at these red dots, it fits right in there. Um, and again, I know another uh, you know, um, topic of discussion in the past has been that just vacant land there on Central and Francis on the north w on the northeast corner. Um, that seems like you know just the perfect opportunity for those two. Now, perfect opportunity is um, is only a perfect opportunity, you know, unless we <laughs> we get the approval from the landowner. But um, you know, to purchase the property. But um, just looking at the need on the north end of Chino, um, those you know those uh, those parcels of land seem like just. Uh, um, great opportunity um, if we can get in there be proactive um, you know even um, again if, if there's estimates that are brought back and our city attorney can run some comps and um, you know that could be um, something I think the council would definitely be interested in considering at the very least um, and uh, but other than that I'm um, going back to uh, Karen's recommendation and I guess recommendation by the uh, staff as well um, when we look at the sphere of influence was it mentioned that you were also um, being proactive and looking at property up there as well? Okay, okay, good. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, again, I just bring up those two. I'm sure you guys have looked at them before. If you haven't, then, um, well, there you go. Um, but, I mean, I, again, thank you for the presentation, and um, I would love to see more, more parks here. And I'll tell you one thing that really wasn't discussed, and I know a lot of residents have mentioned this before is um you know just a dog park right there's no there's no dog park here on the north end of chino as well um i know we have um i think one or two down there near the preserve um and um, i i i mean i and looking at property and, and looking at the you know designs and, and things like that i'm going back to any sort of special use that may be below the three acres that kurt was talking about um you know um again i, I think it's just having that at the forefront would be you know would be awesome you know working with place a dog park um, that'd be great as well but again thank you for the presentation very good information um, 
it's, it's I'm just not very loud. I don't know why. Uh, it's it's interesting looking at the circles on on uh, half a mile within a park, but there's different kinds of parks. You know, some of them are passive, some of them are active. The new little park that's being built, it's going to have a lot of nice amenities to it, but the parking's going to be very very tiny. So if it's an extremely popular park. Um, we're going to potentially have some parking and neighbor problems. So um, although it's a nice little park, it's a little park. Um, so I think I agree, since I live in that area, we obviously need something up there for the residents, especially with all the high density that's been built, because there's literally nowhere for the kids to go to ride bikes. There's no big open space. Um, Looking at the red, red dots, this is going to be very challenging because, um, as Curtis pointed out, many of those places are all built out. So when you identify open parcels that could potentially be for sale, and please identify the ones that even aren't for sale because we could also contact landowners. But in some of those areas, it's going to be challenging to find land that could be open to develop a park. There may not be. Uh, land available, but it's going to be interesting to see. I also agree that we need uh, to have you bring back potential areas that, that we could be looking at for parkland. Um, I like the idea. I had no idea that Chafee College was not going to build out their <coughs> land, and I believe that that land was actually given to us first, and I think we approached Chafee and gave them that 100 acres because I think what we got from the state was the whole, I think it was 200 acres. We carved out 100 for Fry Isla and 100, I think it was 100, don't quote me, um, for Chafee. So that lease may have originally been just with the city of Chino, I'm not sure. But it would, if they're, if they're definitely not going to use it, I think you talked about an indoor gym. That would be an ideal place to put something like that because you've got the whole sports complex down there. And then the golf center, I know we've had big outcries for dog parks. And the, the little one that was built in the preserve is, is a cute little dog park, but it's not for the whole city. You know, it's just for the people down there. Um, so if we were to take the golf center and make that a really nice dog park, you know, if we could incorporate some snack bars and stuff like that, I think it would be really nice. So it's going to be interesting to see what you bring back. I just want to point out um, at Ayala Park, um, east of the football field, there's that dirt lot. That yes. is a future phase, and that was to be parking and a dog park oh, in that location. Oh, So there are future phases for Ayala Park. Um, okay. We're also looking between the uh, APOC, Ayala Park Operations Center, and YMCA was going to be tennis courts. That was all looked at before pickleball existed, and now yeah. pickleball is very popular. So we're looking at future pickleball and tennis courts, as well as additional parking. And then on the south end, we're looking at a couple basketball courts and another um, large playground um, area. Oh, OK. And those are future phases for Ayala Park. We also uh, we had a not a written proposal, but there was a thought that was brought forward from an independent person that had seen what um, uh, the Magnolia people. Um, Magnolia so, Farms. Yeah, how they took a piece of property and there's a little chapel and restaurants and all kinds of stuff. There was a proposal being put together with some nonprofits and businesses that wanted to look at the golf center area and do something similar to that. I don't know where that stands, but I could give you the name of the individual later, and you could contact him to see if they're still working on that. Because that also would be nice, especially for parents to drop their kids off. It would give them a place to go, you know, with their young children stuff, waiting for the kids to finish their games or whatever. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, Mayor. Just one more thing. If potentially, yes. if, um, if we're retooling that area of Ayala Park, there's so many little kids there that are there with. You know, soccer and softball. I think um, kids like the the splash pad effect. We just have the one there in Monta Vista Park. It's wildly popular, and it just gives kids an opportunity during the summer. And it gets hot here in Juneau to cool off. Um, there's also been some um, innovative designs that even you know, you know um, in shopping areas as well, where they insert those you know uh, with a, with a collaboration. Um, so just anything that we can do, we go into development or design to 
to look at that, those opportunities as well, I think is, 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 is a good idea. So, and the, the dog park mayor, my niece and nephew like Discovery Park because of the, the stuff down there, and that dog park's got people in it all the time, every oh, time yeah. I'm there. So, it's tiny. So it's nice to hear there's a, you know, that's on the horizon for us. Curtis, you had something I, additional? I do, and I, I don't know if you've done it. I'm sure you probably have, but, you know, the amount of years and experience and different areas uh, throughout the city that our Community Services Commission live in, what a tremendous resource they are as well to tap into on these, specifically these deficient areas, mm -hmm. uh, to figure something else out because, like I say, a lot of them have lived here for many, many, many years, uh, and they're aware of their neighborhoods and uh, what may be coming up. And uh, But again, just different ideas. Our, our Community Services Commission uh, could probably provide that if we haven't already tapped into that resource. Well, and they're also, each commissioner is assigned uh, certain parks, so maybe getting their input also on what they see is needed. That's a good idea. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much, Carolyn. And uh, it's, well, it was a good presentation. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, and is there anyone from the public in the audience that uh, would like to address the council on this issue? Okay, sorry, seeing none. Thank you. Get wrapped up in the, the subject matter. Okay, item number three, Community Services Department Mission Statement and Name. This is to receive a report and provide feedback regarding a proposed change to the Department Mission Statement and Name. Sylvia Avalos will be providing us with our staff report. She's the Director of Community Services. Good afternoon, Mayor Uloa, Pro, um, Mayor Pro Tem, Comstock, and Council Members. Um, as you mentioned, the following presentation is the proposed change to the Department Mission, um, department mission, mission Statement. Um, as the Parks and Facility Master Plan in 2022 uh, was being finalized, um, the consultant team met with our department staff to conduct a, vis a visioning workshop with approximately 40 department staff. During the workshop, staff was presented with the, re with the review of the Parks and Facility Master Plan community input, a list of the department's offerings, and the level of services provided. As part of this workshop, this, um, as part of this workshop with staff, the consultant team had the group review the department current mission statement, which is dedicated to enriching our community by providing, providing a variety of traditional and innovative recreational activities, caring counseling services, and quality parks and facilities. As the group reviewed the mission statement, it was decided that the current statement no longer reflected the department's overall purpose. With the direction of the consultants, staff created an action-oriented mission statement that best reflects the purpose of the department. The recommended new mission statement is to impact lives and build a connected community. This new mission statement reflects the department's purpose through the program, services, facilities, parks, and special events that are being offered. Is there any feedback on the recommended new mission statement? Seems a bit short. I mean. And impactful, I think it's. Uh, well, I just mean I could think um, public works that would fit public works, it would fit the PD, it would fit, to me it's not carved out for community service, that's just my input. Okay. Yeah, it's not, I'll hush. Any comment from council members? I think it's too broad, Sylvia. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I, I would like it somehow, like if you saw that standalone, you wouldn't know what department that applied to. We could, I mean, we, we definitely could go back and, and what we would call massage it a little bit and work with um, the... Um, Maybe you could add, like, to impact lives and build a connected com community through, through and then something that... Recreation counseling. Yeah, through I, something that... Defines. I would also like to see it a little bit more specific to the, to the department. So, Or it can be the department name mission is to something impact Good. lives and build a connected community something that ties it to community services but then you want to change your name also to so what are you changing your name to or what are you proposing so the change? proposed change um, and I could go to the next slide um, 
So also through the um, Parks and Facility Master Plan, um, it was noted that the public didn't relate the community services name to the overall services and programs offered through the department. Currently, community services, it was mainly um, associated with our case management, social services, and counseling services provided. So adding the, we are suggesting the name change to be community services, parks, and recreation. So adding parks and recreation to community services. That is the recommended change. I think that's an excellent idea, and I agree. A lot of people, they, they think of parks and rec. They don't think of community services. So I think that's an excellent idea. And that is very specific to what you're doing out there. So I, I really like that. Mm -hmm. But I think now going back to the mission statement, Correct. it's just to, it's milk toast. <laughs> I think I think I would recommend, it, I understand where you're going with this, but to impact lives and build a connected community to your appropriate parks and recreations and you know counseling service or something in there that's more that draws it back to, okay. to your to the to the department specific. Somehow. Yeah, we would uh, definitely mm -hmm. take it back to the it department team, yeah. and we will um, come back with a different uh, mission statement. Okay. I like the new name. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think it's I cool. agree. I like it. Yeah. Chris? At the previous council meeting, we had a um, public comment, um, and this guy uh, mentioned the phrase and beyond. Um, I'm not mm -hmm. saying you have to include that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's an idea. Oh, my. Does it include the words in, to infinity as well? Yeah. To yeah. infinity and beyond. <laughs> Well, I can. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Buzz. <laughs> Sorry. I, I would agree with the other comments. I think the mission statement is too broad, but I do like the name. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, consensus. We like the name. Any other comments? Okay, thank you very much. Did you have anything else? Yes, I have one other sec a presentation. Okay. Oh, no, well, on this one. Oh, no, not on this one. Okay. Yes. Do we have any members of the public that would like to address the council on this item? I remembered. Okay, seeing none, now we'll move on to item number four. Community Services Commission discuss the current length of terms of office and compensation for Community Service Commission members. Sylvia Avalos will once again present the uh, staff report. This is our final presentation is on the Community Service Commission terms of office and compensation of members. The department proposes that the Community Service Commission is equally aligned with the Planning Commission term of office and compensation of members. Um, currently the Community Services um, term of office is three years and the Planning Commission is four years. It is proposed that the Community <coughs> Services Commission term of office is changed to four years to be consistent with the Planning Commission. In addition to the term of office, there is, inconsistency, there is inconsistency in the compensation of members. The Community Services Commission serves as a liaison between the residents and the City Council. Along with attending the Community Services Commission monthly meetings, the Commission actively attends additional meetings and activities. For example, they participate in assigned subcommittees, such as the CDBG application approval and funding recommendations, firework booth review and approval, and the Department's user fee recommendations. They attend collaborative nonprofit board meetings such as the Chino Valley Historical Society and the Chino Cultural Foundation and participate in the selection and mentoring of the Teen Advisory Committee. They are each assigned two to three parks to visit monthly where they connect with the residents and are responsible for reporting any safety and liability issues. They also participate in community events such as helping judge the Halloween event costume contest and the Chino Days Art Contest. Currently, the Community Services Commission per meeting compensation is $75. It is proposed that their compensation is the same as the Planning Commission per meeting compensation of $125. Aligning the Community Services Commission with the Planning Commission with the term of office and per meeting compensation will position both commissions as equal and consistent. This concludes my report. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'll uh, start with, oops, with Chris. Chris? No questions. Um, I will just say, I, I mean, I agree. I think um, in our uh, Community Services Commission and, um, you know, does a lot of work. And I'll tell you, I've seen the list here, and um, I was just thinking of multiple other things that I, you know, I see them at. You know, um, so the events they attend are all those and beyond. 
um, you know, <laughs> looking at some of our, um, you know, school functions around here, um, you know, um, whether that be baseball games, basketball games, you know, um, we have, you know, one particular one now is, you know, some basketball games. So, I mean, again, I think it's well-deserved. Um, I think this is, um, you know, just perfect timing, um, although, um, uh, again, perfect timing. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I agree, no question. So. Mark? No, I, uh, I also agree with uh, extending it to four years and also uh, compensating the same as uh, the Planning Commission. I know that the Planning Commission does a lot of uh, reading because of the development that's coming in, but the Community Service uh, Commissioners, they, they do attend all the events. They do go out and inspect parks. So where they're a little bit more hands-on and it's required, I mean, you were you expect to see our community service commissioners at these events because this is what their job entails. You don't really expect to see a planning commissioner, although you do see some, but I think it's expected for the for our uh, community service commissioners to attend these things. So I would agree that uh, their pay should be in line with the planning commission, same as their terms. Karen? I agree. I agree with the comments, Mayor, and I think we've been very fortunate to have some really, really good members of our community assigned to the Community Services Commission, and I see them at many events, as Chris has already stated, and Mark, and their time is, is valuable. They go above and beyond in serving our community, and they are really part of the, the face of Chino uh, from, and, uh, from our staff to the commission members. So. I agree with the recommendations as proposed. Curtis? I think it's important that, that it is equal uh, throughout. Uh, being part of the Planning Commission uh, for a while, uh, the way I was, I can, I can tell you that our Planning Commissioners are out there uh, just as much as the Community Services Commissioners are at the events throughout the city. I think it's equal. Uh, there are some that attend more functions than others, depending on what their, what their availability is. Uh, so I, th I think it's important that they're compensated in the same way. So I agree with that. I agree with, with a four-year term. Uh, I have absolutely no problems with that, but I, I do want everybody to know that our planning commissioners are uh, just as active uh, if not more than a lot of our community services commissioners. That's all I have. Okay. Without perjury. <laughs> okay. You've got a unanimous um, agreement with your recommendations. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to address the council on this item? Okay. Seeing none, then we will adjourn to our next meeting which will be the budget workshop on Monday, May 15th at 4 o'clock p.m. Our next regular meeting will be held on Tuesday, May 16th at 6 o'clock with closed session no, line, no, no sooner than 4 o'clock. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>